Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is a man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here with you. So today's guest is Dr. Mark Lewis, the executive director of the Emerging Technologies Institute, otherwise known as ETI, which is a nonpartisan research center that's focused on technologies that are critical to the nation's economy and national defense. Mark is the former longest serving chief scientist of the Air Force. He is perhaps best known for his work in hypersonics. Prior to his role at ETI, Mark was the director of Defense Research and Engineering in the Department of Defense, overseeing technology modernization for all military services and DOD agencies, as well as the acting deputy undersecretary of defense for research and engineering. And in that role, he was the Pentagon's senior most scientist, providing management oversight and leadership for DARPA, the Missile Defense Agency, the Defense Innovation Unit, the Space Development Agency, federally funded research and development centers, and the DOD's basic and applied research portfolio. So Mark is also a professor emeritus at the University of Maryland, where he spent 25 years as a faculty member, and there he conducted basic and applied research that was focused on hypersonic aerodynamics, advanced propulsion, and space vehicle design. At the Department of Defense, Mark worked closely with Mike Griffin, who appeared on episode 134 of STEM Talk. In today's interview with Mark, we will again discuss hypersonics and other emerging technologies and modernization priorities that are critical to our national defense. Before we get to our interview with Mark, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we're especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker KC Carl. The review is titled, Really Timely. The review reads... Just wanted to thank you for the timely episodes you've had recently. The Mark Matson, Martin Koldorf, and Mike Griffin interviews were all such timely episodes that dealt with topics that are on everyone's minds because of current events and trends. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Casey Carl, and thank you to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Mark Lewis. STEM talk. STEM, talk. STEM, talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. Hi, welcome to STEM talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining us today is Mark Lewis. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Don. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Mark. <laughs> hello, Ken. So, Mark, let's just get started from, from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Oh, so I grew up in New York, in Westchester County. I was born in the city of Yonkers, but really grew up in a place called New Rochelle in Westchester County, north of the city. Okay. And then then what were you like as a kid? (laughs) As a kid, I think I was basically insufferable. (laughs) But seriously, I was was the nerdy kid. I I kind of was the kid who was interested in in airplanes and spacecraft, and that was kind of my whole world. Did you uh, make little drawings of spacecraft? So I, I built models. I was really into model airplanes and model okay. rockets. And man, I my bedroom growing up had basically every conceivable model airplane and model rocket yeah. you can imagine. I had a lot yeah. of them, but probably not as much as you. Do you remember <laughs> that smelly glue? I think it was Tester's glue. Was... Oh, Tester's, absolutely. Yes, yes. Horrible Yeah, stuff. that was something that my dad was really into that too. So he had a bedroom full of, um, you know, of planes and ships and, and rockets. So that's really cool. <laughs> Yeah. So, Mark, we, no- we normally ask our guests if there was a teacher or a book or something that happened to them when they were young that first sparked their interest in science. And I understand that you have a pretty funny story that's related to this from your time as president of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. So when I was president of AAA, which is, I, I think, as you and our listeners may know, is, is the, the Aerospace Engineering Professional Society. So we began a campaign uh, an advertising campaign called When Did You Know? 
And the idea was to interview leaders in aerospace to ask them when they knew they wanted to be aerospace engineers. But the basic idea that aerospace engineers often know they want to do, they want to do aerospace engineering from a very early age. So they set me up for my interview and the cameraman sets me up and they start the interview and they ask me to tell the story. And I basically explain that I really knew when I was sitting in the den with my family watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon in Apollo 11. And, and the interviewer is, you know, the interviewer is, you know, tell me what a great talk that is and how impassioned that is. And then we stop rolling and the interviewer uh, steps away and the cameraman looks at me and says, yeah, you and everyone else. <laughs> because basically every single person who had been interviewed had kind of, from our generation had kind of had a similar story. But, <laughs> but, it, but it's absolutely true. I mean, I remember watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. I, as a kid, I, I was hanging on every Apollo mission, every Gemini mission before that. You know, I, was, I would follow every launch. I would follow every step along the way as I could. As, you know, I'd, I'd get home from school and immediately turn on the TV. That was in the days when every space mission was broadcast 24-7 on, on television. And that was kind of the spark. Yeah, now kids uh, yearn to grow up and invent the like button. <laughs> yes. Although I, I, I still think we have this, this cadre of kids growing up who are just fascinated by space, fascinated by aviation, and still driven to, to do aerospace. I hope so. I understand that your brother, who is four years older than you, went to MIT and that as a senior in high school, you naturally had no desire to go to the same school your brother had attended. Certainly understand that. So having appreciated that, how did you end up at MIT? Ah, so, well, so as a, you know, as a senior, I applied to the usual list of schools. And actually, I narrowed it down to MIT and Caltech. And it's funny because I remember in my 18-year-old self, I was convinced my life would be ruined if I picked incorrectly between MIT and Caltech, which, of course, <laughs> uh, I look back on and, 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 and laugh at because I, I, I think either one would have been fine. But, but you're right. My, my older brother was, was a physics uh, undergraduate at MIT, and, you know, I used to visit him up there. And so I wanted to do something different. So I was kind of more, I was leaning towards Caltech. And then I got a hold of the MIT course catalog, and MIT has a Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And frankly, just started reading some of the course descriptions. and like, oh, my gosh, I could take a class in rocket propulsion. That sounds amazing. And I could take a class in astrodynamics. And so that kind of sealed it for me. So I wound up going to MIT and uh, never looked back. Spent eight years there. Not, not all for one degree, by the way. It was a year for yeah. a couple degrees. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would be yeah. Uh, disconcerting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, the old John Belushi quote, six years of college down the drain. Yeah, yeah. no. I, <laughs> so, Mark, after earning your master's and Ph.D. in aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, you took a job as an assistant professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Maryland. So how did that job come about? So, you know, I'll, I'll take a step back. When, when I first showed up at MIT as uh, a freshman, I actually thought that I would wind up doing planetary science for a career. And I wanted to do the sideline, the background of aerospace engineering. So I'd be the planetary scientist who understood the space missions and instrumentation and all that. And as an undergraduate, I realized I thought much more as an engineer than as a, as a scientist. I, I worked in a planetary science laboratory for uh, a summer and a January and realized that I, I figured out what I didn't want to do, and that is I didn't want to do planetary science, although it still fascinated me. So I knew I wanted to do aerospace engineering. And then as a graduate student at MIT, as I was winding down, I had an incredible PhD advisor, Dan Hastings, who, of course, is, is famous in aerospace. Time he was he was a brand new assistant professor. I was I was actually his first PhD student. So he's 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 now a legend in the field. But Dan was really good about sitting down with his students and kind of talking through career options. And he knew I was gravitating towards a faculty position. And so um, went through the list of, of available positions at the time, and I went on the interview circuit and uh, ultimately wound up at the University of Maryland. Hmm. Yeah, Dan is an, uh, Dan is an amazingly uh, accomplished, but also an amazingly good person. I, I remember serving with him on the National Science Board, and, you know, he was always the voice of reason. Yes, yeah, he was... You know, it, it, I, I would always tell my students that when you're, when you're choosing a PhD advisor, you're not just choosing someone who will advise you for a couple of years. You're, you're choosing someone who you will have a connection to and attachment to for the rest of your professional life. And, and that was certainly true for me. That was absolutely true for me. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that. Um, so for 2002 to 2004, you became the director of the Space Vehicle Technology Institute. So can you give our listeners an overview of the institute and the work that goes on there? So it was an institute that we started at the University of Maryland. So, so I'll kind of step back. Aerospace engineering at the University of Maryland had a pretty long history. The research activity in aerospace 
actually started as aeronautics and was started by a gentleman named Glenn Martin of the, you know, Martin Airplane Company, now part of Lockheed Martin. And Glenn Martin, after World War II, moved his company to Baltimore. He, he looked to the University of Maryland College Park campus as a source of, as a workforce and also a, a partner in research, he put a lot of money into the campus. But frankly, the University of Maryland had been a very traditional aeronautics department, hadn't done a lot of space. Biggest activity when I joined the department in 1988 was in helicopters. Uh, they had a big rotocraft center, which is still there today. And there was a desire to ramp up on both the space side and on the hypersonic side. So I came on board as an assistant professor and began building a research program that overlapped in space and in hypersonics. The, the center that you referred to was actually was basically the culmination of that. And it was jointly funded by NASA and the U.S. Air Force. It was begun under a program that was funded by NASA that had the inglorious name of the URI program, which is a horrible sounding acronym. It's in for University Research uh, and Engineering Technical Institutes. And, and basically, it was the brainchild of NASA associate administrator by the name of Sam Veneri. And it was to give a you know, slug of funding to universities that would encourage you know, large infrastructure investment on research and engineering activities associated with NASA interests, in this case, hypersonics, and then included some space launch. So that was kind of the kickoff. The fun part about the URIDI program is it began as a NASA program, and then the Air Force signed on as well. So the Air Force became a co-sponsor. And so we had both the civilian side and the Department of Defense side, and did that until 2004. And then I wound up leaving campus for a uh, long-term leave to go work in the Pentagon. So when I did that, I, I handed off the operation of the center to one of my colleagues at the university a gentleman named uh, Daryl Pines, who today is the president of the University of Maryland. So that worked out pretty well. Yeah, that uh, that's interesting. And uh, Sam Veneri was uh, known, uh, I worked with him in the late 90s at NASA. And he was the kind of guy that uh, swung for the fences. And, and you strike out a lot when you do that. But some, yes. some of uh, the stuff he did was lasting and, and useful. It wasn't even one of, one of the really exciting things. So we started the program, as, as you pointed out, in the early, early 2000s. And then as NASA ramped up the Constellation program, they saw this incredible resource with the Eurydice that, that they had seeded. And so they actually pulled the Eurydice into the Constellation program and increased the activities, increased the funding, built a larger university consortium. It was a really exciting time to be a part of that effort. Yeah, Constellation was exciting and it was depressing when it went away. I agree. I agree. In 2004, and you sort of alluded to this uh, as to why you departed Maryland, in 2004, you took over as chief scientist of the United States Air Force, and you went on to serve for quite a long time. In fact, I think you were the longest serving chief scientist. Can you walk our listeners through the role of the chief scientist and the areas of emphasis you had during that time? I think the Air Force chief scientist role is somewhat unique among the services, and it's had a long history. Oh, absolutely. So the Air Force chief scientist, as you say, it's, it's an amazing job. It dates back to the earliest days of the United States Air Force. So if, if, I, can, if I can delve a little bit into Air Force history, is, as you may know, the Air Force was established as a separate service in 1947. It was coming out of World War II. There was this realization among many of the air power thought leaders that we needed a separate service that was the Air Force. But before it became a separate service, the, the founding fathers of the Air Force knew that they needed to have a basis, a research basis in science and engineering, that they needed to inform this new service with input from the brightest minds in the country. So in 1944, three years before the creation of the separate Air Force, there was established something called the Scientific Advisory Group. It was chaired by the legendary Theodore von Karman, who also founded the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, an Aerojet Corporation. But, you know, von Karman was an absolutely legendary figure in 20th century aerodynamics. And von Karman chaired the scientific advisory group uh, starting in 1944. By 1950s, though, there was a realization that the Air Force needed an in-house scientist. And so the position of chief scientist was created. There, there's some interesting traditions associated with it. By tradition, the chief scientist comes from outside the Air Force to provide that outsider's viewpoint, often filled from a, someone coming from a faculty position or from a, a, a government laboratory. The many great aspects of the job, the chief scientist is basically empowered to be free willing, free thinking, and free speaking. One of my predecessors, a gentleman by the name of Mike Yaramovich, who was chief scientist in the 1970s, he likens the job 
to uh, serving as the court jester. And, and here's the, the, the reason. This is the analogy. So, you know, in medieval times, you had the king and you had the upper nobleman, and there was always the jester in the castle. And the jester was often the only person who could speak honestly to the king without having his head lopped off. And that's the job of the chief scientist, right? You're the entertainment. You're the scientific entertainment. You tell them some, you know, fun fact from science. But you're also the person who can speak honestly and clearly to the chief of staff of the Air Force, the, the lead general of the Air Force. And that makes the job absolutely, absolutely amazing and frankly unique. You know, when, when everyone else in the room would be saying, yes, this is something we should do, or this is a great idea, or sometimes this is a bad idea, this isn't something we should do. As a chief scientist, I could say, well, here's the science behind it. Here's the physics that dictates this. Here, you know, here's the chemistry. Here's what we need to think about. And because the chief scientist has no programs under their direct control, has very few people working for them, they don't have a dog in the hunt. So um, I, or I think I might have mixed the metaphor there. <laughs> but, but the point being that they can speak independently. And the other great part about the chief scientist's role is that because it's not a permanent position, your career doesn't depend on the answers that you give. So you can be very, very honest. So at any rate, um, so I did the job as chief scientist. I started in 2004. By tradition, it's a two-year job. Actually, when I first started, it was only a one-year job, but it expanded to a two-year job. I have to say, I, I had so much fun doing it that when they asked me to stick around, I wound up sticking around for a total of four years. And you know, I, I, I was able to focus on a number of areas. One, I, I, I was able to be a really strong advocate for basic research, arguing for what we call 6-1, basic research investments in the Air Force, looking you know, in the far horizon investments. As you know, my primary research areas are in hypersonics, so we were able to spend a lot of time getting hypersonics up and, up and running. At the time, the Air Force was, was ramping up a program called the X-51, which was a hypersonic flight test program. So helping to guide that program, frankly, protecting that program from the budget cutters was a key role. But I also got involved in everything from workforce issues to um, looking at some material solutions, directed energy, you name it. One of the really fun parts about being chief scientist is, and when people would ask me, what is a, a day in the life of the chief scientist like? I, my answer was, no day is like a previous day or a following day. Every day was different. There were times when I was, you know, I get the phone call from the chief of staff asking me about whether you can put a laser on a fighter jet. The next day I get a phone call from the secretary of the Air Force asking me to recommend <laughs> the best television for his conference room and, and things like that. So it was really incredibly varied. But for me, the best part of the job was working with colleagues in the Air Force. I mean, you get a whole different perspective. It was so different from my academic experience and really in, in incredibly enriching and enlightening. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. In, the, in 2012, you became the director of the Science and Technology Policy Institute, which worked with the executive office of the president and other executive branch agencies. So can you give us a bit of an overview of that work and the work of the Science and Technology Policy Institute? Sure. So, you know, when I, when I was doing the chief scientist job, I was doing it on leave from my daytime job as the, at the University of Maryland. And so 2008, when that was over, I went back to the university. And I have to admit, some, uh, a bunch of my friends had said, you know, it's really tough to go home again. And as much as I love teaching and as much as I love being on campus, they were kind of right. I, I found it was really hard to go home again, especially since <laughs> I went back to the university. I wound up with, with what I consider the single worst job on a university campus, which is uh, I wound up as the department chair. And, and, and it's, it's kind of it's one of those thankless jobs. I, I have some friends who do the job and really like it. I, I have to admit I did not. So I did that for a couple more years. And then, then I had the opportunity, as you mentioned, to step into the leadership position for the Science Technology Policy Institute. I'll tell you a little bit about that organization. STIPI, as, as its acronym is called, is a federally funded research and development center, an FFRDC, which is a type of organization, it's a special organization funded by the U.S. government. FFRDCs usually have a sponsor. They develop a deep relationship with their government sponsor, and they're supposed to provide deep dive expertise, knowledge, and continuity to that government agency. Lots of examples of FFRDCs. Um, uh, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is an FFRDC. Department of Energy National Labs are FFRDCs. So it's a brilliant construct in the federal government. STIPI is a very small FFRDC. In fact, it's the second smallest one in the federal government. And it has a unique mission because it supports the executive office of the president. And in particular, supports the Office of Science Technology Policy and the president's science advisor, usually the director of OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy. So we're the only FFRDC in the executive office of the president providing direct advice and guidance to the president's science advisor, and then by extension, Office of Management and Budget, sometimes the National Security Council, and then other federal agencies. And that included everything from NASA to the National Science Foundation, sometimes Department of Energy. What was particularly exciting when I was there, we had the re-establishment of the National Space Council. 
And so the National Space Council reached out to us at STIPI to help us think through what the Space Council should do, how it should function, and in particular, what were the principal policy issues they needed to focus upon. So that was, that was a tremendous experience. But we also, you know, at STIPI got to help shape national policy across the board, everything from energy to health to workforce issues. It was really a, a very rewarding work. Yeah, it absolutely sounds like it. So Mark, I want to circle back to your academic career. You talked a little bit about this already, but you spent 25 years as a faculty member at the University of Maryland conducting basic and applied research in fields that include hypersonic aerodynamics, space vehicle design, and also you looked at advanced propulsion. You're perhaps best known for your work in hypersonics. So what led you to focus on hypersonics specifically? Ah, uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I actually started out life. I, I knew I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. When I started as a graduate student, I was actually working on gas turbine engines. In fact, my master's thesis work was in flow visualization inside gas turbine engines. And gas turbines are fascinating machines. They're some of the most efficient machines on the planet. The fluid dynamic issues associated with gas turbine engines are, are some of the most challenging you could ever, ever imagine. But I had to admit, I got a little bit bored. And, and, and no offense to my friends who work in gas turbines, but I had the realization that we already knew how to build this technology. I mean, you could go to the gas turbine engine store and buy a gas turbine engine. And a lot of the work that in the we were doing in the research community was aimed at you know, making incremental improvements and in efficiencies of you know, compressors or turbines. And I, I was fine of losing some motivation. And then a couple of things happened. One, the United States began a national program called the National Aerospace Plane Program, the NASP. It was really exciting. President Ronald Reagan went on national television and announced that the federal government was investing in a hypersonic airplane that was designed to take off from any, run, any large runway and fly up to orbit as a single stage to orbit vehicle. An incredible challenge. By the way, in retrospect, it was a bridge too far. We don't know, didn't know how to build that vehicle. But for a graduate student, this was just an incredible challenge. So that had happened. And then at the same time, Dan Hastings had just joined the faculty at MIT, and he had some work in conjunction with Draper Laboratories to support this National Aerospace Plane Program. And so I went to work for Dan and went to work on the National Aerospace Plane Program. And the rest, as I say, is history. I mean, that, that kind of charted my course. I became a hypersonics guy. And my, my PhD work was looking at supersonic combustion ramjets. It's one of the types of engines we envision as powering a hypersonic vehicle. I looked at what we call engine airframe integration, so how the engine interacts with the rest of the airframe and vice versa. And, and that kind of set the stage for, for most of the rest of my research career. Hmm, you can see that. Recently, we had our mutual friend, uh, Mike Griffin, on the podcast to talk about hypersonics and, and much else, frankly. Mike was the Pentagon's first undersecretary for research and engineering. It was a new position that was created by Congress when they directed a major reorganization in the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act. When you decided to join Mike at the Pentagon, what intrigued you about this new research and engineering organization that he was putting together? And can you tell us a little bit about the experience? Sure. So there are a number of, one of the things that intrigued me was, frankly, the opportunity to work with Mike. So I had first met Mike Griffin when I was a brand new faculty member at the University of Maryland. Mike had done his PhD at Maryland, had left before I got there. But in many ways, I wound up with my job because of Mike. As a graduate student, and then he stuck around as a lecturer, he kind of complained about the fact that the department didn't do enough in space and needed to ramp up in other areas like hypersonics. And so the department listened to him. So in many ways, I, I owe my job to the fact that the department created a slot in part in, in response to Mike's views on that. So we'd remain pretty close friends. And in fact, when I was Air Force chief scientist, he was NASA administrator, and we had just done a number of things together. I, I, I would point to it as a kind of a golden age for cooperation between Department of Defense and especially the Air Force and, and NASA. I mean, we were, we were on speed dial uh, with each other. And so when, when Mike wound up in back in the Pentagon, he asked me to join him as he was stepping up, as he was standing up this new office. And so the opportunity to work with Mike was, was really very difficult to resist. But, you know, broader context. So I was really fully engaged with what Mike was trying to do. So the creation of that office, the R&E office, I think was a very important step in establishing the importance of science and technology in the Pentagon. And, and let me explain that. So as you may know, before the research and engineering office was created, science and engineering was part of Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, ATL. So you had an Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics. And under that Undersecretary, 
you had a director of defense, research and engineering. And that was because there was a sense that research and engineering needed to support the acquisition community. So you needed to be investing your money in areas that will help the actual weapon systems. Number of people, both in the building, but most importantly on Capitol Hill, realized that that had a downside, which is that research and engineering, science and technology was kind of being put a bit on the back burner or it was being funded to, to only serve the acquisition community. And so it was actually Senator McCain, who was the lead for breaking research and engineering out from under ATL and creating a separate undersecretary of defense for research and engineering. And so that was the job that Mike came into. He was the first undersecretary. And one of the things that, that when Mike walked in, so you know, as, as you know, Mike is one of, the, one, of the, one of the smartest people on the planet. He's a really big thinker. And so as he organized his office, he knew that he had to put a particular focus on a series of priorities, modernization priorities, technology areas that the department needed to focus on. And so he asked me to come in to lead that for him. And again, that was just too good an offer to pass up on. So I was, I was the department's modernization guy. I had everything from space and cyber, artificial intelligence, 5G communication, quantum bio, and of course, hypersonics, which was a top priority for Mike and, and clearly a top priority for me. Yeah, I can see why it was hard to resist uh, the opportunity to work with Mike. When he was the NASA administrator, I was the chairman of the NASA Advisory Council. And like you, I've been on lots of these kinds of roles. And normally they're frustrating to some extent, if one is honest, mm. because you would like a richer, deeper, more impactful engagement. And yeah. Mike was the ideal uh, administrator from the perspective of the advisory council, because the discussions were frank and intense. Yeah. And uh, you didn't present an idea to him if you were one PowerPoint slide deep. In other words, yes. um, that that would be the only slide. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah. I absolutely found him refreshing and uh, unique in that role. Yes. No, I agree. And, you know, it, it's, I would sit in his office and you just listen to the man speak. And he's just this font of wisdom in so many areas. So, so yeah, it really, it really, was, it really was fun working with Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll actually point out something else that, that I found intriguing. Mike built an incredible team. So, so by the time I joined the team, we had Mitch Nikolich as the ddr &E for uh, science technology. We had Jim Faist as the ddr &E for advanced capabilities. But they became my colleagues, incredible people. We brought Sandy Magnus on board. She was running mission engineering, former astronaut, head of AAA, again, a great thinker. Other members of the team, Mike had attracted a group of what we called, ultimately called our principal directors, each one overseeing a different technology area. Mike White in hypersonics, Mike Zatman in network command control communications, Tom Carr in direct energy, Nicole Pettit in microelectronics, so many others. And it just brought such talent into the new organization. It was just a fun team to work with. Yes. And that, that kind of insistence that he has on technical excellence and scientific excellence is deeply out of fashion in Washington. So it's, uh, it had to be a, gr a great and unique opportunity. I agree. Under, under Mike, um, the correct technical answer was always the correct answer. Right. And, and, and that was refreshing. Absolutely. And rare. So speaking of Mike, during Mike's time as Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, he made hypersonics the department's number one priority. And I know we can reference that in our STEM talk with, with Mike as well. He worked under Mike as a Director of Defense Research and Engineering and became the Acting Deputy Undersecretary when Mike resigned in 2019. So can you give our listeners a sense of the importance of hypersonics in terms of our national defense? Sure. And, and you're exactly right. And one, one of the things that also, I mean, Mike and I have talked about, had talked about hypersonics. Uh, one, one quick little anecdote, which is in, in 2016, I chaired a panel that looked at how you would defend against hypersonic systems because we knew that Russia and China were building up in this area. At the same time, Mike had chaired another panel with the National Academies. And so they had us occasionally outbriefing our studies together. And it was funny because he, he heard my outbrief, I don't know how many times. So even though I never directly outbriefed Mike because he was sitting next to me as I was doing the outbrief, I, 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 think, I, I think he picked up on it. So, so I'm going to claim a little bit of credit there for Mike walking into the building and acknowledging that hypersonics was so important. So yes, um, let's talk a little bit about hypersonics. So why is hypersonics important? I, I argue it's a critical technology for our, the future success of our national defense posture. I view hypersonics as the next logical technolo technological step to follow such things as stealth technology. 
And why is that? Well, hypersonics does a couple of things for me. Hypersonics is, as you know, high speed. We usually define hypersonic flight as flight in excess of about five times the speed of sound. Hypersonics is not new. We have been flying hypersonic vehicles since the late 1940s, right? Every spacecraft that has re-entered the atmosphere from space uh, or entered a, a foreign planetary atmosphere has traveled at hypersonic speeds. The space shuttle was a hypersonic vehicle. The Apollo capsule was a hypersonic vehicle. This is not a new area. But when we talk about hypersonics today, we're really using that term as a shorthand for the combination of speed, but maneuverability, and also certain altitudes and trajectories that go with that ability to travel fast through the atmosphere. So in the biggest sense, hypersonics is about survivability. A hypersonic weapon is a weapon that is more likely to accomplish its mission because it's more difficult to stop than its subsonic counterpart. And the way I explain it, I'll go back to the building on stealth, all right? The, the whole idea behind stealth, when all is said and done is, stealth technology makes me hard to see. Not impossible, but very hard to see. So if I'm a stealth aircraft, I'm hard to see, which means I'm hard to stop. If I'm a stealth weapon, I'm hard to see, so I'm hard to stop. We've been operating stealth technologies now for an entire generation. The world has had an opportunity to see how we use stealth. They've had an opportunity to build countermeasures and also to introduce their own stealth capabilities. So what's the next logical step? Well, if I can be seen, the next logical step is that I travel in such a way at high speed and with unpredictable maneuverability that even though I can be seen, they won't know exactly what I am or where I'm going, and I'll be difficult to stop. And that's what brought hypersonics brings to the fight. So a hypersonic cruise missile is a missile that is, you know, moving really quick, quickly by definition. So it's hard to know what it is. It's hard to identify it, hard to keep track on it. But because that hypersonic weapon is maneuvering, it's using aerodynamic forces to maneuver, they won't even know exactly where it's going, right? So that's why it's important. Now, the United States has been doing hypersonics. Oh, well, I mentioned the, the National Aerospace Plane er, earlier, but we've been doing hypersonics, as I mentioned, since the 1940s with some major forays. But the reality has been that the field has gone through these boom and bust cycles. Every 10 to 15 years or so, we invest heavily in the field, we've got programs, and then we stop investing. And it's been very frustrating. When programs have failed for reasons unrelated to the technology we're trying to develop, we've canceled them. In some cases, when programs have been successful, we've canceled them. So as a result, progress in hypersonics has, has frankly been limited, and, and we would take two steps forward and one step back. A very big driver, was the realization that we have foreign competitors who saw the opportunities in hypersonics and invested very heavily and frankly moved ahead of us. And, and the two countries we worry about the most are Russia and China. So by the 2000s, we were already seeing reports that Russia and China were investing heavily in hypersonics. And the intelligence community, by the way, did a phenomenal job of, of just figuring out exactly what these countries were doing, where they were investing, what their, their goals seemed to be. And then, frankly, a number of us started sounding the alarm. Um, I'll, I'll claim a little bit of the credit for that, but there are other people as well, people in the intelligence community. I think by, the, by, by about 2015, 2016, there was the realization that we are in a race. And it's a race that we dare not lose because of how critical this technology can be. So when, when Mike came into the building, I think he had that mindset. He knew that, A, we need hypersonic technology. By the way, regardless of whether Russia and China are developing it, this is an important new capability for the United States. But B, we have a time scale driven by foreign competition such that we have no time to waste. We need to ramp up production of hypersonic systems. We need to have programs of record. We need to get these capabilities into the hands of our warfighters as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And following up on that, and uh, earlier we were discussing Mike Griffin. So here's a question uh, for you contributed by Mike Griffin. You know, he's continuing on the theme of hypersonics, and he suggested that I ask you, when do you think an effective air-breathing hypersonic tactical round can be available on a production basis? Ah, so I, that's a phenomenal question. And the, the reality is we have right now our air-breathing programs really, really are centered around a DARPA program called the HAWC program, H-A-W-C. And a program we were running out of the Office of the Secretary of Defense called High Fly 2. And both of those rely on supersonic combustion ramjets, scramjet systems. Realistically, with the right investments and the right mindset, we could be deploying in the 2025, 2026 timeframe, realistically. It's not a matter of developing the technology per se. We've been flying scramjet-powered cruise missile-type configurations since 
the X-51 program, which first flew in 2010. That's 12 years ago, right? It's not a matter of maturing the technology, although it, there's clearly a step to go from a developmental effort to an actual deployed weapon. But there are no miracles that we need to solve. There are no, no new laws of physics we need to discover in any way, shape, or form. This is technology that's at hand. So it's really just a matter of the financial commitment and the strategic commitment on the part of the department. Absolutely. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, performance, and resilience. Recently, Russia test-launched the RS-28 Sarmat, a liquid-fueled, MIRV-equipped, super-heavy intercontinental ballistic missile, sometimes colloquially known in the West as the Satan II. What is your take on the RS-28 Sarmat and this first test flight? So, I'm actually, frankly, not as worried about what the Russians are doing in hypersonics, because for me, it doesn't quite change the equation. And let me explain that. So I recently wrote, a, wrote an op-ed in, in NDIA's National Defense Magazine, where I, I actually stole a quote from a movie, a movie called The Kingdom of Heaven, which was a Ridley Scott movie about the Crusades. And there's this wonderful scene in the movie where Saladin uh, has just, and, his, and Saladin's army has just captured Jerusalem. And the protagonist of the movie asks Saladin, you know, what does it mean that you've recaptured Jerusalem? And Saladin looks at him and says, meh, Jerusalem means nothing. And then he stops, he says, Jerusalem means everything. I apply the same thing to what the Russians have done. So if I actually step back and say, what new capability does this give the Russians? The reality is, it doesn't actually give them a new capability. And, and let me explain that. And so today, think about a conventional ICBM launch. You know, the Russians start launching ICBMs, God forbid, that is a horrible day for the human race. But let's say they do that. And we start to see ICBMs coming over the poles. What's our response? Well, if it's an ICBM, we'll have a pretty good idea where it's going to go. You know, you see the launch, it's a ballistic missile, you pretty much know where it's going to land. So let's say we see an ICBM and it's headed towards New York or Chicago. How do we respond? I hate to say it, we don't have much of a response. Our missile defense agency is not designed to defend against a full-out launch from the, the Soviet Union. It's, it's aimed at defending us against, you know, rogue nations, the Irans and the North Koreas, right? So NDA is gonna, not going to do a lot for us. Are we going to be able to evacuate New York or Chicago in 20 minutes? We couldn't evacuate New Orleans in 10 hours when we knew there was a hurricane coming. So that's not a practical reality. So, so the bottom line is, if today we see, you know, we, we, the Russians launch on us with ICBMs, it's a really bad day, and therefore something that has to be avoided at all costs. Now, let's change that equation. Let's give the Russians a maneuvering hypersonic weapon. Right? Make it a maneuvering hypersonic uh, 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 ballistic missile. Great. They launch it. So the big change from what they're doing now to this future capability is we'll no longer know where it's going because it's hypersonic, it's maneuverable. And that means watching it launch doesn't necessarily tell us where it's going to land. How does that change things for us? I hate to say it, it doesn't change things very much at all. Whether or not we know if it's going to New York or Chicago, you know, it's, it, because we didn't have a response in the first case, we don't necessarily have a response in the second case. And the result is I don't worry as much about what the Russians are doing. But what I do worry about is the messaging that goes with what they're doing, right? Why are the Russians doing this? Let's take a step back. The Russians have been bragging about using hypersonic missiles now in Ukraine. Why? Um, we can't see any reason they need hypersonic missiles in Ukraine, right? Hypersonic missiles are good against fleeting targets. They don't have those. They're good against, you know, deeply buried, high value targets. They don't have those. They're good against targets that are protected by air defenses. Well, we don't think they're going up against that. So why are the Russians already using hypersonic weapons. I would argue it's strategic messaging. Absolutely. It's reminding, yeah, they were reminding us that they have a technology already deployed that we don't have. And the other thing is the Russian systems have ambiguity associated with them. They can put a conventional warhead or a nuclear warhead on the same system. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think the Russians kind of doing a little bit of saber rattling. And, and I'd also say we've seen a little bit from the Chinese as well along those lines. So end of the day, the systems that I worry about the most aren't these sorts of systems. It's the tactical systems. It's the Chinese missiles that can sink our aircraft carriers. It's the Chinese missiles that can crater our airfields so our airplanes can't take off. Those are the ones that I really worry about the most. 
So Mark, in 2008, when you were winding down your time as the chief scientist at the Air Force, you launched a study that became known as the Day Without Space Study. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of space in our national defense and perhaps elaborate a bit on how not everyone in the department agreed with the report's conclusion about the critical importance of space assets. Right. So, you know, I think it was it was said very well by by a previous secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson who commented that when we built our existing space infrastructure, we built a glass house and forgot the neighbors could throw stones at it. And so we, 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 in 2008, as you say, we we did the Day Without Space study. It was actually co-sponsored by me and my colleague at the time, Janet Fender, who was the chief scientist at Air Combat Command. She'd come out of the Air Force Research Lab and was the principal scientific advisor to the four-star general at Air Combat Command. And we both felt that we needed to do this deep dive into what it would mean if we lost our space assets. But the realization that the United States military is incredibly dependent on space, more than any other military. And it's one of our strengths, but it's also a vulnerability. And we had adversaries who were understanding that vulnerability. So we kind of did the extreme case, which was, all right, let's assume we lose everything. What does it mean? And that, you know, that, that's probably an, an absurd assumption. We wouldn't lose everything, but we could potentially lose a lot of assets. And we began to show part of the, I think, part of the value of that study was to show some of the warfighters how dependent they were on space in ways that sometimes they themselves didn't understand. So we, for example, would say, okay, well, so if we lose space communications, we'd have people say, oh, we've got other things that can fill in. We can do other solutions. But then you follow through on what those other solutions were. And at some point down the line, those other solutions also depended on space, right? So so we weren't as independent as, as we thought. For me, one of the most telling outcomes of that study was a quote that came from our then head of air combat command, previous vice chief of staff, a general by the name of John Corley, who at the time, I think was one of the great thinkers in, in the Pentagon. And, and when asked what, what he thought a day without space would be like, he said, go rent a copy of Saving Private Ryan, you know, the Tom Hanks movie, where, you know, it's a movie set in World War II where they have obviously no space assets and there's no situational awareness, right? We didn't know where our people were. We didn't know where, their, the, the, where the enemy was. We didn't know where our different units and components were. It was, a, it was very difficult to have situational awareness. We didn't have communications of, uh, to an extensive degree. That's what life would be like without space. Now, not to go on too long, but, but I can say there clearly has been a sea change in the Pentagon since that study was done, what now, 14 years ago. I mean, I don't think you'll find anyone in the Pentagon who doesn't acknowledge that space is vulnerable. We need to focus in this area. I'd even argue one of the reasons we created the Space Development Agency and the Space Force was to address these vulnerabilities that we first identified with studies like the Space Without, the Day Without Space study. Yeah, absolutely. There's, we, we are so dependent on space. And as you say, it's one of our greatest advantages. And like many great advantages, it opens up a vector of vulnerability as well. Absolutely. So looking at another technology, what about directed energy? You know, this is one of those topics that has been around a long time and sort of waxes and wanes, but it's mm. a topic of potential great importance. Would you talk about that? Sure. So you know, I, I think in many ways, there are some strong analogies between directed energy and hypersonics. So the joke in the hypersonics community for the longest time was hypersonics is the future <laughs> and it always will be. Directed energy has kind of suffered from that as well. There's a sense, you know, it's just always over the horizon. We're almost there. We're almost there and we never quite get there, except I think now we're there. Yeah, I think so we're too. At the, yeah, where are the energy levels now where, where direct energy can do some really interesting things? I think the other important thing about direct energy is we've matured in our understanding of how we would use directed energy. So you go back to kind of the early thoughts on directed energy. Very often it was just replacing the gun with the laser. And that turns out to be not a particularly good thing to do. If the gun already does the mission, why replace it with a laser? Instead, use the laser to do things that the gun can't do. Or use the laser in ways that the gun can't serve. I'll give you one of my favorite favorite applications. So think about defending the, the surface fleet, the, the U.S. Navy. A laser would give me an almost limitless magazine. So I can keep shooting my laser in ways, you know, I'll, I'll run out of bullets at some point in my gun, but as long as I've got electric power, I won't run out of laser shots. So if you're defending a surface ship, say, against a drone attack, uh, lasers seem to be, you know, pretty ideal for that application. There's some interesting things you can do with lasers for space applications as well. 
I think we're also realizing that lasers can play a significant role in other applications. For example, laser communications. Um, the Space Development Agency that I mentioned earlier that Mike Griffin set up, one of the things that they're looking at is you know, laser, laser communications. And that gives you sec secure communications, gives you lots of advantages. So again, I, I think we're really in the, in the dawn of an important age in direct energy. Hmm. So perhaps this is a good time to talk about your new role as the executive director of the National Defense Industrial Association's Emerging Technologies Institute, which is a nonpartisan institute that's focused on technologies that are critical to the future of our national defense. So Mark, can you give us a bit of an overview of the research and analyses that are conducted by the institute? Sure. So let me let me start out by, you know, my, I've got some Air Force friends who like to say, it's always better to be lucky than to be good. And I would just say, if, if I were to characterize my career, it's, I, I was really lucky a bunch of times. I was <laughs> lucky when I got asked to do the chief scientist job. I was in the right place at the right time. I was really lucky when I got the phone call to run Stippy. I was really lucky when I got the phone call from Mike Griffin. And as I was winding down my time in the Pentagon, I got the phone call to come over to NDIA to start up this institute that you much, just mentioned, the Emerging Technologies Institute. So NDIA, is, as you may know, is, is, is a defense organization, an industrial organization. It's been around for over 100 years, about 103 years. It's an organization that consists of about 1,800 defense industry members, also has academic members, um, about 65,000 individual members. And it serves as an organization that represents industry to government, provides forums in which government and industry meets, discuss the defense, uh, defense needs. It's an amazing organization. The leadership at NDIA decided to set up a think tank, if you will, a separate organization, independent objective that would focus on emerging technologies. And it was the same list of emerging technologies that I was working on when I was in the Pentagon. So it was basically a dream job following on to what I was doing in the Pentagon. So we set up this institute with a focus on the modernization priorities that really came out of the national defense strategy from 2018. And that's that you know list that I mentioned earlier in space and hypersonics and cyber and directed energy. I brought an incredible deputy on board, Arun Serafin, who has you know had a long career in government in the White House and on the Hill on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, we're building research teams. Um, one of my colleagues, Rebecca Wilsonberg, joined me from the Pentagon. She supported the Secretary of Defense. She's leading a supply chain study that we're extremely proud of. But basically, we set up this institute to be an independent think tank that will focus across the board on this range of technology technologies, doing workshops, sponsoring meetings, conferences, putting out reports. We're doing our own podcast, column in National Defense Magazine, all with this theme of how we get these critical modernization priority technologies into the hands of our warfighters. Hmm. So, Mark, one of the Institute's most significant initiatives is called the Vital Science Project. And this is a report that measures the well-being of the nation's defense industrial base. And this is the third year that the National Defense Industrial Association has released this annual Vital Science Report. So I guess our first question is, how did this project get started and what are its goals? Right. So the Vital Science Project was spearheaded by NDIA's policy branch. And it was it was really designed as an assessment of the as the name implies, that the health of the industrial base. When I came on board at NDIA, uh, as we were starting up the Emerging Technologies Institute, my colleagues over in the policy side of the house asked us to step in and do an emerging technologies chapter to address these, these future capabilities. But NDIA teams up with Govini, which is a, a data analysis organization, amazing organization, and looks at a range of indicators that kind of Try, try to grab an overall picture of the state of the industrial base. I guess the big news item this year was, for the first time since NDIA has been doing it, you mentioned it's the third year, we gave the industrial base a failing grade. And now, it wasn't a failing grade because of industry. It's a failing grade because of a number of factors, including COVID and the environment in which we're operating. I can see that, and I'm, I'm sure it was more than just COVID. When thinking about these reports, you know, when you do reports, it's always... You always feel good about them if they have an effect. Do you feel right. that these reports are having a useful effect? So, very much so. When the Vital Signs report came out, we, we had a lot of interest, a lot of publicity on it. We had a lot of follow-on phone calls, frankly, from the Pentagon, from the Hill, asking for deeper dives on the data, asking for you know, what folks in government, and also, by the way, folks in industry can do to... Uh, get the industry out of that failing grade. I will say one of, one of the things that really attracted me to joining NDIA is, is exactly as you point out, the, the impact that this organization has. Um, amazing team. We have a you know, brand new CEO, uh, David Norquist just joined us. David was the Deputy Secretary of Defense when I was 
back in the Pentagon. So my, my new boss is my old boss. So that's pretty cool. And this is an organization that's extremely well connected and has a lot of resources. And so, so the simple answer is yes. I think this is a report that's already having a lot of impact. That's really good. Hmm. So in this 2022 report on five areas, the, the authors of the report assigned a failing grade and perhaps the most troubling decline came in the supply chain performance, which had a very poor grade of, of 63. So the report noted that the decline reflected the turbulence the economy is facing and some of it's caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, as, as you've noted. But the report's authors went on to say that they expect next year's report to reflect even greater supply chain issues. So can you give our listeners a sense of why this is such a major problem for the Pentagon? Oh, absolutely. So that's something that I, would, that I was actually very much involved with. And we had an industrial base council that was led by Ellen Lord uh, when she was the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Sustainment. As COVID was ramping up, we were looking at supply chain issues and we were seeing all these vulnerabilities across the board. And sometimes there are vulnerabilities that you didn't expect or you wouldn't predict. And frankly, in some sectors, the situation is getting even worse. You know, take microelectronics as, as an example. So of course, we're all familiar with the supply chain issues that we're facing with microelectronics. Anyone who's tried to buy a car in the last year is aware of the fact that car manufacturers are having a challenge getting microelectronic components to complete their manufacture. The Department of Defense represents less than 2% of the overall microelectronics market in the United States. And so not surprisingly, if you have difficulty getting microelectronic chips across the board, the department is, is, is facing shortages. But then we're seeing shortages and supply chain issues right down the line. Most recently, uh, an issue that has gotten some, some attention in the press is the supply of neon gas. Ukraine is a supplier of neon. It's an important element in the manufacture of certain microelectronic components. And the war in Ukraine is having an impact on neon availability. We also worried about vulnerabilities in uh, certain uh, raw materials. For example, some of the ingredients in energetic materials, some of the rare earth elements. The United States doesn't necessarily control the manufacture or the processing of rare earth elements. And so we, we saw some vulnerabilities there as well. And um, I, I think as the report highlights, uh, this is not something that's going to get particularly better in the immediate future. Hmm. Another area in which the report gave a relatively poor and declining score was in the area of productive capacity and surge readiness. Can you uh, define for the listeners what is meant by the term surge readiness and just elaborate a little bit on this area? Sure. So, you know, a, a perfect example we saw just, just this week as the United States is sending more missiles to the Ukrainian armed forces, we're looking to up production of certain weapons. And I, I just saw the CEO of uh, Lockheed Martin being interviewed on uh, uh, national television over the weekend talking about how they're quickly ramping up production to do a surge capacity to supply weapons that are needed. But we can't necessarily do that across the board. It's kind of well known that when you start a conflict, you kind of start that conflict with whatever weapons you have on hand. And especially the nature of modern warfare is such that things will evolve or devolve very, very quickly. So you may not have an opportunity to suddenly start producing more weapons. Whatever you've got stored, whatever is in your magazine, that's what you're going to war with. And so that's certainly a concern, being able to respond to a sudden change in the situation, being able to deliver weapons, deliver capabilities, deliver technologies. That's a sort of surge capability that, frankly, right now we don't have across the board. Mm. Let me, if I can, I, if I can elaborate on that one. So also when I was in the Pentagon, we did a couple of war game exercises where it became clear that the side that won was the side with the deepest magazine, the side that had the most weapons. And that's really important to remember. If you think about an Indo-PACOM scenario, you know, in, in, in the Pacific, where the United States would be fighting an away game, having enough weapons to actually prosecute that fight becomes absolutely critical. So if I can, you know, circle back to our, dis our earlier discussion on hypersonics. And one of our goals in hypersonics, when I was working with Mike, wasn't just developing the technology. It was delivering the technology in significant numbers that we had a deep enough magazine that it actually would make a difference. You know, if all you wind up doing is creating a handful of weapons, you know, if you're doing onesies, twosies, maybe, you know, uh, if you can count your hypersonic weapons on one hand or two hands, that doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't scare an, adver it doesn't scare an adversary. It doesn't give you a new capability. You need to be thinking hundreds, thousands of new weapons if you're going to deliver a capability. 
Mark, when we read the report, the major thing that stood out was how government funding for research and development fell by 12% between 2011 and 2016. And during the same time frame, China increased its R&D investments by 56%. So what's your take on this? And then also, what are the likely consequences if this trend continues? So I'll start out by saying I'm an unabashed advocate for investments in research and development. And that goes across down the scale, in, including fundamental research. So the good news is the Department of Defense is still far and away the largest single investor in research, development, test, and evaluation in the U.S. government. This year's budget, the presidential budget, is well over $100 billion in rdt and &E funds. So that's the good news. But the devil is in the details. And trends are important. Not just trends in where you're investing the money, but the trends in fighting inflation. And indeed, you're right that if you look across the board, compared to inflation and certainly compared to our peer competitors, the news isn't, isn't necessarily good. For example, in, in basic research, you see that the department has been, frankly, cutting funds in that area. That's particularly worrisome because basic research is our seed corn. It's where we invest in our universities. It's where we invest in our future workforce. There is an easy tendency when you're faced with big bills to uh, underfund the future. It's true in our daily lives, right? If I've got a mortgage to pay and I've got, you know, food to put on the table, then I'm not likely to contribute as much to my 401k plan, my future. But the reality is it's absolutely essential we continue to invest in our future so that we can have these critical technologies available. So we'll have the next direct energy. So we'll have the next hypersonics. And so those trends are, are, are indeed disturbing. You mentioned China. So China, the investments in China are, you know, staggering. China is right now the number two investor in the world, and they're rapidly moving towards first place. And complicating that is we don't really have a thorough understanding of how much you buy in terms of research in China compared to what you buy in the United States. You know, a dollar in China, or whether you want in China, the China dollar equivalent, buys a lot more in China than it does in the United States. So the trends are disturbing. I will say there is there are some bright lights. Right? The first is even though China is rapidly you know, in increasing their investments. If I take the investments in the United States and I add that to all our friends, partners, and allies, together, we completely swamp China. And that's an important realization. It's really one of the strengths of the science and, and technology enterprise in the United States is our connection with friends, partners, and allies. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I can you know, build on the hypersonics theme, so we were joined hand in glove with the Australians as one example, working closely with the UK. In fact, in almost every technology area that I can go through, you'll see strong partnerships between the United States and our allies. And, and some of them are, are partnerships you wouldn't expect. You know, there you've got the usual partnerships, Australia, UK, Canada, even New Zealand. Then you have countries, you know, across Europe and also countries in Asia, Singapore. The United States was even working with Vietnam in, in, in some technology areas. So that's the strength of our system. And it's not just their dollar investment. It's their different perspectives. It's their different expertise. And also the fact that, you know, the United States has, has roughly about 4% of the world population. So that means we have roughly first order 4% of the smart people in the world. And so working with our friends, partners, and allies really expands our technology base. Mm. One other point that I'd like to make about this. The United States is still the place of choice for international students and international researchers to come and study and stay. About 20% of international students who study in a country other than their own come to the United States. Now, there are some people in the United States who see that with, with a bit of alarm. They say, look, we're giving away our technology. I come from a, from a different standpoint. It's, it has always been the American tradition for the best and the brightest to come here and to stay here. And that's still what we see. The vast majority of international students want to remain in the United States. They embrace our freedoms. They embrace our spirits of innovation. And that's also an incredible contribution to what we do in defense technology development. So that's, that's the capability that we have. I will tell you, if we ever get to the point where the best and the brightest from around the world don't want to come to the United States, that they'd rather go to China or they'd rather go to Russia, uh, then, then we're really in, in, in trouble because then that's when we will have lost the bubble in terms of being the world's technology leaders. That's for sure true. On a less optimistic note, some of the new emerging technologies have very low barriers to entry. It's difficult to build certain things, as we all appreciate. My own field, for example, AI, whatever investment we make in basic research in AI typically is fielded first somewhere else, typically in yep. China. And uh, we're very, very poor at getting technologies into the hands of the warfighter from basic research. You know, there's this 
legendary valley of death. In my field, for example, AI was one of the identified critical technologies. We've done a pathetic job as a country in moving that into actual fielded weapon system based AI. And、uh, we spend a lot of money on it, but the instant there is results, it has no benefit to us. In preference over China, for example, bec not because our system is bad, because we don't act on it, we can't field it, and we, we, our procurement system is not set up appropriately for a field like AI. And this is a topic that the National Security Commission on AI talked about a lot and put it in the report, but I'm sure that aspect, which is a critical aspect, will be widely ignored. So, so Ken, I, I absolutely completely agree with you. AI is, is a particularly painful event,、uh, example because if you look at where industry is right now in AI and you trace back to where their work came from, it actually came from some initial investments from the Department of Defense. Of course. And yet, and yet the department is now finds itself trying to play catch up. We had major efforts underway to try to you know, bring commercial capabilities back into the department. And I'm going to admit with limited success,、yeah. although you know, we, we had some successful examples. I'll tell you the other thing that really worries me, especially in AI, and that is that we can look at our peer competitors and very candidly, they, they will not treat AI with the same ethical standards that we would apply. And you know, I, I, I will go on record. I have very little confidence that the Chinese will apply the same ethical standards in the use of AI that we in the United States would apply. Well, yeah, and- so that makes it. Yeah. And we wring our hands about,、uh, about things like autonomy excessively. You know, we've had、yeah. autonomous weapons for a long time.、Uh, they just yeah, weren't smart.、Exactly. I mean, a landmine is an autonomous weapon. It's exceptionally exactly. stupid, but it's,、yeah. it's autonomous. This,、yeah. um, you know, we, we do a lot of self afflicted wounding in AI.、Yeah. And, and it's a field where we seem not to understand that you need the very best people. Yeah, no, I, you know, one of, one of, my, one of my big concerns is, is getting the best and the brightest, the most talented people in the field working on behalf of the department. And it's something the department was struggling with. And I, I think there's a case to be made that national security applications can be among the most exciting, frankly,、mm -hmm. and the most rewarding. But I, I don't think we s e a l the deal yet. I don't,、no. I don't think we made the, the case. We're, we're not even and, trying and,、yeah. in AI.、Yeah. You know, if,、yeah. if you're a young engineer、yeah. and you can work on a hypersonic system, that's exciting. Um, yeah. But you know, we, we, don't tell that, it, we don't tell an exciting tale and a tale of importance and work that matters and that has value. We, we, you know, we, we don't tell that story in the computer science community very well. Yes, I know. And, and in some cases, there was a negative backlash within the community towards supporting national defense definitely. Uh, uh, activities. Oh, definitely. You're, you're, You're exactly right. I'll tell you another thing that I, I witnessed, which is frankly just a, a poor understanding of what AI really is and what it can do. You know, Mike Griffin had sort of the running joke that people in the Pentagon, when confronted with a problem, they would just say, oh, and now I'll just invoke some AI and you o k n we'll w get some AI and solve this problem. Like they could go to the AI store,、right. you know, buy a can of AI, sprinkle it on whatever it is they're <laughs> trying to do. <laughs> and, and they didn't realize it didn't work that way. Yeah, it's,、uh, it's the current version of Magic Beans. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, circling back to hypersonics, as you mentioned earlier, we used to be the world leader in this technology. And that's partly because we used to be the world leader in an aggressive test fail approach to innovation. I mean, we were doing lots of testing, but we're kind of not doing that much anymore. And there seems to be real resistance to that approach in Congress. But innovation requires aggressive, technologically risky approaches. And sometimes, you know, as you know better than most, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to stretch and reach far. Do we need somehow a new mindset in terms of innovation and test and evaluation programs if we're going to really excel in hypersonics and surpass our peer competitors? So the simple answer is absolutely. And frankly, the new mindset we need is the old mindset that we used to have. Before we became so risk averse. You know, let me, if, I, if I can, let me, let me give you my kind of perspectives on where we are now compared to, frankly, where we used to be.、But、I think the poster child for a successful experimental flight test program in high speed flight was a program called the X 15. X 15 was a rocket plane that was designed in the late 1950s. It was designed to go at hypersonic speeds. There were three X 15s built. They flew, the three combined flew 199 times and set. All manner of records, altitude record, speed record. The X 15 still holds the manned flight record in the atmosphere at Mach 6.7. That's a more than 50 year old record,、yeah. by the way. But that important, that, that idea that we had a vehicle that we were flying 
basically every 18 days we could fly it early, you know, fly it early, fly it often. If something, we, if something happened, we didn't understand, we could fly again. We could learn. There were even some accidents in the program. At one point there was an X-15 being tested on the ground or testing a new engine. The engine exploded, blew the cockpit down the runway. The pilot was Scott Crossfield, legendary, legendary test pilot. Survived it intact. They rebuilt the airplane. They flew it again. Yeah, no another congressional incident. investigation yeah. required. Exactly, exactly. And there was another incident where an X-15 landed hard, broke in half. They said, great, we wanted to build one a bit bigger anyway. We'll put a center section in. Tragically, there was a an X-15 that was lost at one point in the program, towards the end of the program. It didn't end the program. It was a bad day. Everyone was respectful. It was investigated, but the program continued. Now compare to where we are. Even our most successful programs we're, we're kind of limping along. We've gotten into this mindset where we fly once every couple of months if we're lucky. Maybe we fly once every couple of years. And, and I'll illustrate that. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in the conversation an Air Force program called the X-51, which was one of my very favorite programs, something I was very proud to have been involved in. It was a supporter out of the Air Force Research Lab. DARPA was involved in it as well. X-51 flew four times. Compare that to the X-15 flying 199 times. Now, the fact that we were only flying four times had some major implications in the program. I'll explain that. So 2010, we had the first flight of X-51. It was mostly successful, mostly, but not 100%. Well, we only had three left at that point. And so we wanted to be darn sure we understood what went wrong with flight one before we did flight two. So we had a review board. We had an evaluation panel. I was actually involved in that. We rang, rung our hands. It turned out that on the very first day of that flight, we pretty much knew what went wrong. And after we investigated it for months, it turned out the first day we were right. But now we went to flight two. Well, flight two was almost a year after flight one because of that review process. Flight two was a failure. It turned out we had a problem with the ignition system. Once again, we evaluated it and wrung our hands and, and, and didn't want to fly again until we were absolutely certain what happened. <sighs> almost another year went by. So we go to flight three. Flight three was another failure. So at this point, we only had one X-51 left. And we had people in the Air Force who said, oh, geez, well, we can't fly that last one because, you know, what if it fails? It's the last one we've got. There were people who were saying we were going to ship it to a museum and have it sit unused. Absolutely, absolutely insane. Wow. But, you know, that's, that's what happens when you only have, when you, only have you know, two Zs and three, uh, three Zs, as opposed to, you know, frankly, tens or hundreds of, of tests available. Now, further kind of complete that picture and, you know, kind of stop the madness. At the time that we were flying X-51, we had folks in the department who were pushing a whole different program. It was going to be a whole different hypersonics flight test program. And for the price of that new program, I estimated we could have done 50, 50 X-51 flights. But we had too many people focused on what I would call next programitis. Instead of flying something and learning about it and flying it again, they just wanted to move on to the next thing without actually seeing it go to deployment. And that program ultimately got canceled, but as a result, we didn't keep flying X-51. Now, what are the implications behind that? Well, X-51 demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt the ability to operate a supersonic combustion ramjet for a long period of time. Its first flight was in 2010, its last flight in 2013, then we effectively shut the program down. The next time that we flew a long duration supersonic combustion ramjet in the United States was the DARPA Hawk program. And that was in the fall of this year. So that was almost 11 years after the first flight of X-51. Now, recently we had another flight, the other DARPA Hawk vehicle. This one built by Lockheed Martin had, a, had an incredible success a few weeks ago. It was a great accomplishment. But, you know, we're in 2022 now. So that's, that's now 12 years after the first flight of X-51. So it's very clear you don't make rapid advancement if you operate that way. So all of which is to come back to, we need a mindset in which we are flying early, we are flying often. When things break, we fly them again. When things fail, we learn quickly why they, why they failed, and we, we recover, and we move forward. And that means we really need to be rethinking our flight test infrastructure. Absolutely. We can't be doing it the way we're doing it. Yeah, we seem to have confused failure in a test, mm -hmm. which is a learning experience, with failure of the program. So, you know, Absolutely. And, and those Absolutely. are two really different things. Absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you something else that I, that I worry about. And, and I saw this my first time in the Pentagon. And I saw this again my second time in the Pentagon, which is too often we've actually forgotten what experimentation is about. So you hear this term demonstration bandied about. We're going to demonstrate something. We're going to do a flight demonstrator. And to me, a demonstration is, is in most cases worthless. Demonstration to me means I think I already know the answer. I'm just trying to prove it to someone. Right. 
And that, that means there are two possible outcomes. One, you demonstrated it works, and people say, well, okay, so what? You kind of knew what you were doing, so what have you done? Or you fall flat on your face, in which case they look at you and they say, huh, well, you didn't really know what you were doing, and that's kind of the end of it. As opposed to experimentation. Experimentation is a different mindset. Experimentation means there are things that I don't know that I need to learn about, and therefore I will do the experiment, and whatever answer I get, is useful information. That's the mindset we need to be moving towards. That's the mindset that will drive us back to this successful flight test regime. Now, if I, if I can stay on my soapbox on this, I will tell you that one thing that I worry about, I put failures into two basic categories. There are noble failures, and then there are dumb failures. The noble failures are the things that fail because you just you didn't understand the science or you thought you did, but you didn't, and you need real data, whatever. The dumb failures are the failures that in some cases are inexcusable. It's when you didn't do your analysis right. It's when a fin falls off where it shouldn't have fallen off because you should have anticipated the loads on the fin. It's when something breaks that shouldn't have broken. It's when a part fails and you didn't have a spare part available. All those things. Those are not legitimate reasons to fail. Those are system engineering failures. So we have to be careful that as we embrace failure, we don't use it as an excuse for sloppiness. Because if we do that, then we're not going to be successful. Absolutely. And I hope that shift in mindset that return to our previous more robust adult mindset happens, but I'm not optimistic. I agree. I agree. Although I will tell you, there are people moving in that direction. You know, one of the organizations that was part of R&E is the Test Resource Management Center. And I think they had a, you know, they, they, they had the job of overseeing tests and evaluation across the entire department. And I think they were very, very firmly committed to stepping up to the plate in terms of increasing our experimental capability, especially our flight test capability. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you another really exciting development. You're seeing private companies stepping up in test and evaluation. So as just one example, there's a, there's a company that, that I, I've done some advising to, a company called Straddle Launch, and they're positioning themselves to become a, flight, a hypersonic flight test company. They've got this large airplane that was original, originally designed for space launch that they've repurposed to be a flight test bed. They're going to drop a vehicle that they call the Talon Vehicle that is essentially a wind tunnel in the sky. And it's a reusable flight test bed, kind of getting back into that S-15 type of mindset, of flying often, flying reusably, getting things back looking at them when they're done flying, learning from that, and flying again. And there are other entities as well in the country that are looking at returning us to this, this rhythm of more frequent flight tests. From uh, your uh, lips to God's ears. Mm. <laughs> but, but notice it's being driven by the private sector. Right, uh, and uh, that's a good thing. It comes yeah. with uh, concerns and caveats depending on who owns the private sector entity and the funding sources and all of that. But Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Well, Mark, you certainly have a lot on your plate right now. Um, so when you're actually able to step away from work, what do you do in your spare time? Ooh, spare time. <laughs> I know not what these words mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, my spare time. Oh, when I can, I, I yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm still a pretty avid reader. I actually like historical fiction. I also like to read history. I'm reading a book right now on, on a biography of Hap Arnold, who's the general who's, general who's often regarded as the father of the U.S. Air Force. Also just finished a book about Joseph Banks, who was the, the uh, British naturalist who was, you know, instrumental in establishing, you know, our modern age of discovery. He traveled with Captain Cook on, on his historic voyages of discovery through the Pacific. Uh, so so that, that's kind of exciting. And, and, um, and uh, gosh, that, that's pretty much it. I guess I'm, I'm kind of a dull character. <laughs> Like you said, the, the spare time you know you know not of. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, needless to say, starting starting up this new institute is it's been a labor of love, yeah. um, but it's also a bit been a, a bit, very big undertaking. Well, Mark, we've absolutely enjoyed speaking with you today, and thank you so much for joining us on Stem Talk. Oh, it's it's been a pleasure and an honor talking about you. Thank you. Uh, it was it was great, Mark. I appreciate you doing it. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. STEM talk. STEM, talk. STEM, STEM talk. talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. Well, Ken, that was an awesome interview. I absolutely love talking with Mark. And I have to tell you, I had no idea that the Chinese were investing so much in research and development. And it's sad to think that in fields where we were once the world leader, that we've now fallen behind both Russia and China, especially when it pertains to hypersonics. 
Yes, it's very disheartening and totally unnecessary. I encourage everyone to check out the Vital Signs report we discussed today as well. There's a link to the report in our show notes. Emerging technologies are critical to both our national defense and our broader economy. Washington and the defense industry really need to ramp up their investments in research and development and make sure that the results from the R&D investment are moved into fielded systems. Definitely agree. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.